Loving Life in Lincolnshire. BBC Radio Lincolnshire. Well, as I mentioned, born and bred in Yorkshire, my next guest is certainly well able to tell you all you need to know about the challenges faced in policing large areas of a rural county, such as Lincolnshire, as well as dealing with the demands of maintaining law and order in the big city. Mike Pannett joined the Met in the late 80s, then returned home to North Yorkshire almost a decade later. Turned author, he's currently launching his latest book, aptly titled Upbeat and Down Burn. I'm pleased to say Mike joins us on the show. Hi, Mike. Good afternoon to you, Rob. You've been dubbed the James Harriet of policing. Is that a fair, a fair label? I think it's 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 a label that, that, that like you say, the media have dubbed me. But, but to be honest with you, it's it's quite a humbling label as well because obviously growing up as a young man in in Yorkshire, it was it was all Harriet and it, it was the great true stories of the thirties and forties, which were fantastic. And you've become something of an ambassador for Yorkshire, and it's turning into the Yorkshire Olympics, isn't it? Just at the moment, it seems. <laughs> so, I, did, I don't look. I'm not. I'm not. You know, I love I love Lincolnshire. I think you, we're so alike. It just happens to be that I think we've moved up to something like. We were we were sixteenth a f- few days ago, but I think we're up to something like seventh or eighth in our own right in in the Olympic table. But uh, but it's a it's a GB effort, um, and it's absolutely fantastic to see. But even the blessed cauldron came from Yorkshire as well, didn't it? I think so as well. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's been held in Leeds or somewhere. I think yeah, absolutely yeah. would have been marvellous. We've got some great venues. No, it's a wonderful county, and as you say, I think many parallels can be drawn between uh, between Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Yeah, uh, still a prominent voice on policing matters, aren't you? Well, well, it's it's certainly getting me uh, up and down the country. I was in London yesterday, and I was I was, I was sort of sat and able to question the uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner about what's what's going on with police. And obviously, it's a year on from the riots. And yes, I've I've seen to be. I think common sense is what um, the public want to hear being spoken. And and thankfully, um, my BBC friends, both you know Radio Five, Radio Two, and and the television people, are, 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 seem to like a little bit of common sense, which is good news and a bit of experience. But in these changing times, uh, there must still be a few issues. Issues that leave you open mouth, I suspect. Oh, there, there, there certainly is. I think um, I think what's been seen. And I, I don't want to be over political, and and I know how difficult and uh, difficult a job the chief uh, constable of Lincolnshire's having at the moment. A big fight on his hands to to maintain, you know, policing in Lincolnshire that that will keep the really good people of Lincolnshire safe. And I think outsourcing, as we've all seen, um, what's happened in the Olympics has has stopped people in the tracks and. And I'm, I've always maintained we need to, we, we should police for the public and not police for profit. And, and as soon as we start going down those lines, um, I think you can see the, the problems which have emerged. So I just hope that um, the, the, the policing minister, Nick Herbert, who I think recently visited Lincolnshire, um, hears what the chief constable has to say and, and get some real funding because you can only cut so far, Rob. I knew we'd go down this road, and we will yeah. get to the book in a moment, but um, let's just uh, take you up on that point then. So, do we take that as a direct thumbs down on uh, part of the Lincolnshire job being carried out by the private sector? I think what people have got to, be, to bear in mind is we, you hear a lot about the front-line policing being maintained. Well, I can tell you right now, nationally, that that is not the case. Some of our big front-line services are being cut. But in, but in, when you look at the talk about the back-office staff, who, who are those back-office staff? Are they front-line staff? To me, they are. If you talk about back-office staff that includes your domestic violence teams it inc- includes your burglary squads your robbery squads your your intelligence teams which are tackling terrorist issues absolutely vital and what you've got to bear in mind is in troubled times such as we've seen last year in the riots and i'm concerned that the, the way we are at the moment we you know there could be potential for for the future the back office staff were able to come out because they were fully warranted police officers the numbers that have been cut should trouble times come you will not be able to pull out your um your your privatised security people to do a warranted officer's job, and it's it, it's a real fine balance. But but the but what's got to happen going forward is um, the ideology that our policing minister's got of privatising our police has got to there's got to be some flexibility, and I think the time has come for Home Office and government ministers to listen to what some of our chief constables are saying. Not all, some of them are saying about time to to negotiate and time to discuss this properly, and I think the public should have a say in that as well. It's, it is a bit worrying. And the Chief Constable, a real countering job on his hands. Neighbourhood policing, a real issue in, in a rural county like Lincolnshire as well. It is, and, and you know, again, I, I was in Tottenham, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm reasoning that because I've got 
you know, some good experience of working in, in, in urban and rural areas. I've spent 10 years in both, you know, in the capital of London and in the most rural areas of, of North Yorkshire, which are similar to Lincolnshire in, in a meta, ma many ways with the people and types of incidents. And what you're seeing in London is this, this great idealism of closing down local police stations. I mean, we've seen that across Lincolnshire and, and across North Yorkshire. And as soon as you start closing those uh, police stations down and moving to these great big what they call super stations or super nicks then you're detaching yourself and leaving that bigger gap to the public and of course i've heard these things well we don't play police officers to have cups of tea well goodness me let me tell you now i gained more intelligence and more information from going out and having cups of tea with people in the community than i would have ever have done um sitting in an office and and that's my big concern we don't want to we want to see our police of course we do and we want the police to be part of that community and it is a difficult time we're all in austerity um but there's got to be ways and it doesn't just involve outsourcing the cheaper option because the long-term um future of our policing is really at stake here and and Public safety as well, and I'm I'm not prepared to sit on my hands, Rob, and and just watch things happen before it's too late. I'm I'm, I'm really going to try my best to to get the message to the public. And equally important, Mike, uh, looking inside out, what do you assess the morale to be <coughs> the force at the moment with all this going on? Well, you, you know, it's 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 to be absolutely honest, I'm I'm. It's fair to say I speak to officers from all over the country regularly, and of course morale is been affected that you, you, you to sum it up what's happened is i believe the pressures the constant talk of the cuts that you know i think all police officers just want to get on with the job in hand and that is trying to um, you know deal with those people who make other people's lives a misery and that's the fundamental reason why people want to be police officers but all the talk at the moment is about cuts and things like that and you know you, 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 you morale is a huge important factor and i think what i'm not seen of nationally are our senior police officers at ACPO level you know the very senior officers who I'm afraid have become rather politicalised and instead of being getting on the ground and, and getting the morale up I think they've been heavily influenced by lots of going ons behind the scenes with, with uh, at, at ministerial level well, here we are. We've been talking eight or nine minutes. I haven't talked about the book yet. Uh, Scott, <laughs> well, I hope you're not okay. dashing off, because we need to talk about no, it. No, that's absolutely fine. We've got the politics out of the way. We'll, uh, we'll return to you in just a moment. Thanks, Mike. Rob Underwood here. It's the afternoon show, BBC Radio Link. I'm delighted to have with me uh, my guest this afternoon, Mike Pannett. Mike spent many years in the force. Uh, he's uh, turned his hand to writing as well. as a series of books, Mike, actually, you've had out, haven't you? Yeah, this is, um, if you like, the fifth, um, and, and at the moment, the final um, Yorkshire-based book. And, yeah, it's it's been a crazy four years. I, I, I can't believe just how well the books have sort of taken off, and it's it really has been a word-of-mouth thing, so I'm absolutely over the moon. And I'm sure this has all been said before, but it does remind me of Nick Berry in Heartbeat, you know, <laughs> big city, goes back, goes to Yorkshire, it's a bit like a fish out of water, as opposed to you, of course, because it was very much a returning home for you, wasn't it? it is, yes, it was. I mean, I think it was great. I loved going, as a Yorkshire lad, sort of born and bred on a small farming area, going to London it certainly opened my eyes and and really it's where you cut I, I cut my teeth and I was only supposed to go down there for two years but ten years went very quickly until I woke up one morning and thought well I hadn't been fly fishing um, in ten years what's going on so I came back and from doing murder inquiries and um, riots and things like that which were very tough I suddenly found myself in one of the biggest beats in the country and and went on to become the force wildlife officer which of course was a completely different change of career but I met some absolutely incredible people and, and who, if I hadn't have met, I could have never have possibly have written these, these series of books. So. You, men you mentioned the murders, the riots, and I think we're only too familiar with, with, with that mm. and with uh, what must be the world of policing and maintaining law and order in the capital. But what about the, uh, what about the, the rural aspect? Uh, what about the challenges there that, that present themselves to you? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of similar in a way. In some respects, policing a rural area can be, I think, a little bit more dangerous, if you like. I mean, one thing, it's the sheer 
year size my beat in particular um which is which the books are based around are some 600 square miles from from where i started in battersea which was about two square miles hmm. so you, you know in london you did have an awful lot of backup uh, available if you needed some assistance or whatever in the rural communities and any lincolnshire rural officer and I, and I speak to some of those quite regularly will tell you that you know if you're in the middle of nowhere you have to use your common sense when you're policing and and just think of where your backup is it could be some 20 minutes away half an hour away and if they have to come out from the city um i often found they could could get lost trying to find you so but i i was lucky in the fact that you know i linked up with the local community the farmers the gamekeepers and set up country watch which um gave me a lot more eyes and ears and, and certainly um gave me some tales to tell in within the, the the sort of the books which which i was lucky to do so i had a lot of help police in the area and, and it was a real good community um beat in the end and i must just ask you going back to heartbeat the program uh, lots of people fondly remember that in fact yeah. i think it's still being shown um how near real life was that would you say i think originally you know it, it, it was um it was my wife's cousin peter walker or, or he wrote in the pendulum of nicholas ray wrote some fictional books based in the sort of 50s and 60s because he was a press officer with north Yorkshire police and he he did a lot of stories and i think the original heartbeat series which i think attracted something like 18 million people and you think about that these days rob um they were absolutely fantastic and when i was in a met i used to look at the programs and think blimey that they're just so good but unfortunately i think they got a little bit um I'm not blaming the scriptwriters, but once they went away from the original um, fictional books, things got a little bit far-fetched, and it, it, it sort of fizzled out a little bit. But even so, when it fizzled out, it was still getting seven, eight million viewers. But I'm, I'm pleased to say that my stories are actually all happened, yes. which, which is, makes it so real, and my characters are all, you know, absolutely real as well, and, and it's all within the last ten years. So it, it's brought everything sort of 40 years further ahead and some 60, 70 years ahead of... of of the old Harriet story, so I'm, I'm really, really humbled and pleased that I've had the opportunity to, to sort of meet the people, but also obviously was in the positions where certain stories that I talk about actually happened to me. So it's, it's take the reader by the hand job and um, come and see what I used to do. Do you know? Has anybody ever said to you, "You're a radio presenter's delight. You really are. Just wind you up and away you go." Well, you yeah. I'm really enjoying <laughs> listening to you, but I must intervene. Yeah. And um, I mean, you say actual stories; they actually happen, but names are changed. Obviously, can yeah. you give us just a flavour of, of a, a, t a sort of a time? of the or a part of the story that that might just make us think well i, I think i think there's so many i mean I've, I've, there's some 70 80 stories but i think one story i'll tell you very quickly i worked very closely with the search and rescue teams and um one evening and this is the sort of things that can happen in the rural community i was on uh, patrol and somebody called me into sort of middle of nowhere about a couple of miles outside malton it's a bit uh, you know towards the edge of the moors and there was two labradors found and with leads on and it was sort of inclement weather in a january and immediately i heard the worst well where's the owners where are the owners and i got a full scale search going on i was acting sergeant at the time and within sort of half an hour i had about 20 officers there and later on i called the police helicopter over from from our neighboring force at humberside i think it was and a huge search was taking place all the resources call the search and rescue teams out and we looked and we looked and i, and I was really concerned and we we had to call it knock it on the head several hours later in two o'clock in the morning six o'clock the following morning we all came back on to resume the search um, and I got a call back to the station at half past seven in the morning as an elderly couple had arrived at the the front desk and had said um, that they turned up um, they didn't want to call last night and report the fact that they'd lost the dog because they saw so much police activity going on they thought there must have something really had, serious had happened and of course oh, the dogs dear. had slipped out but you just don't know what's round the next corner it's you know there were so many things and and some of them quite tough you know we, we you get all the similar incidents um, in the rural communities you're doing in the cities, but on a lot lesser scale. It's a fascinating read. I'm lucky enough to have a copy here. And you're in Lincolnshire tomorrow. You're in Boston and Lincoln doing book signings, aren't you? Perfect. I'm, you know, Boston and Lincoln have, have been so supportive, all the people there. And so, yeah, I'm going to be at 11 o'clock, um, Waterstones, Boston. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody that came to see me the last last year. And um, then across to Lincoln, to Lincoln um, Waterstones at half past one. So it's just fantastic to be back again. You're having a busy time. 
<laughs> very busy. It's, it's every seven days a week at the moment, but it, but that's part of the job, and I, and, and I get to meet all sorts of really nice people, so uh, I'm uh, very lucky. I hope you've got a spare pen for all this signing, just in case. <laughs> yeah, well, well, a good author always carries a few pens. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, it's a delight to talk to you. Good luck with the book and uh, everything else, and I'll continue to watch your tweets. Thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure. Thank it's you. a pleasure. Cheers. Mike Panett. Uh, Mike's the author. Well, he spent his, uh, many years, as we said, in the force, and he's got a story or two to tell. Why don't you get that book and read it? It's well worth uh, getting hold of. Upbeat and Down Dale, as you mentioned, he'll be at Waterstones in Boston tomorrow between 11 and midday, then off to Waterstones in Lincoln on the High Street between 1.30 and 2.30. The book's called Upbeat and Down Dale.